Part 1, Chapter 13 to 17 of This Giddy Globe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elisheva Isis. The Reader. Read by David Lawrence. This Giddy Globe by Oliver Herford. Chapter 13. The Habitable Globe. The term Habitable Globe was doubtless invented by some celestial humorists who had never visited this planet. People live on it, to be sure, but they have no choice. There is nowhere else to live. The giddy globe. Isn't it about time to drop this personal simile? Quite so. Suppose we consider the globe as an apartment house. We are told it was finished in six days. No wonder it is faultily constructed. The heating apparatus is out of date. The apartments nearest to the radiator are insufferably hot, those farthest away unbearably cold, and those between too changeable for comfort. The water supply is unreliable. In some apartments great numbers perish every year from thirst. In the cellar there is a munition factory where, in defiance of regulations, there are stored high explosives. These blow up from time to time, causing great damage and loss of life among the tenants. The janitor is a disobliging old person who has been there since the house was started and holds his job in spite of incessant complaints. When asked to hurry, he fairly crawls, and when people want him most to stay, nothing can stop him. His name is Tempus. Chapter 14. The Tenants. The first tenants, as before stated, were a young couple who had been compelled to leave a more luxurious apartment because children were not allowed, though animals of all kinds, even snakes, were tolerated. On the whole, the globe is anything but a model apartment house. Each family considers itself the only respectable one in the building, and they are constantly squabbling for the possession of the most desirable rooms. The tenants of the different stories, originally of one color, have been tanned according to their proximity to the solar stove. They come in five shades of fast colors, black, brown, yellow, red, and white, the white being farthest away from the stove. There are also some brighter colors which are not guaranteed, varying from the chromatic discord of the post impressionist savage to the delicate rose pink of the perfect lady. This last is the most delectable of all, but alas, it is the one that fades most quickly. Chapter 15. Race. All the families agree that the tenants of the glow should be of one uniform shade. Each family, however, thinks that his own particular shade is the only fitting one for the perfect human being. To that end, he spends a large part of his time in scheming how to get rid of all the other things, all of which is a great waste of centuries. Old Tempus the janitor has always settled the thing question with his solar stove and always will. A week at the seashore in August ought to convince anyone of the efficiency of the solar tint factory. In the tongue of the surf bather is locked up the secret of race coloration. And yet, there are some great and wise ones who believe that civilization, with the assistance of Mr. Marconi and Mr. Rolls-Royce and a few others, will bring the race families into such close relationship that they will eventually be all blended into one harmonious neutral team. A pale mauve wall, one tint, one religion, one food, one dress, one drink, one everything. How appalling! And think of the moment when it is to be decided once and forever which it is to be, blonde or brunette? Oh, those wise and great ones! Chapter 16. Governments of the Globe The best definition of government may be found in World War's lines. The simple plan that they should take who have the power, and they should keep who come. In every community on earth, the strongest, the craftiest, or the wealthiest of the male inhabitants conspire to compel their weaker, stupider or poorer brothers and sisters to pay them for the privilege of remaining on earth. Government by the strongest is called an absolute monarchy. Government by the craftiest a limited monarchy. Government by the wealthiest a republic. In an absolute monarchy the people are controlled. In a limited monarchy they are cajoled. In a republic they are sold. For the successful operation of limited monarchies and republics, it is necessary to delude the common people into the belief that they are managing their own affairs. This is accomplished by means of a house of lords, congress, chamber of deputies, diet, cortes, assembly, soviet, etc. These merry contrivances are designed on the principle 
of the revolving squirrel cage, furnishing harmless exercise without progression. Questions. What is a constitution? A concession to liberty enabling her to talk herself to death. What is the essential difference between one government and another? The price of life. Chapter 17. The morals of the giddy globe. According to Moses, the first geographer, immorality is an heirloom handed down to us by our first parents. Men of science, on the other hand, declare it to be merely the psychoneurotic reaction of climatic environment on the celliferous organism. In other words, vice is nothing more than virtue outside of its natural geographical latitude. This is clearly set forth in the accompanying moral map of the world, in which the familiar idiosyncrasies of mankind, which we are wont to differentiate as virtues or vices, are shown for the first time in their proper geographical environment. End of part 1, chapter 13 to 17, recording by Elisheva Isis, Galiza, January 2010.